The First Amendment of the Constitution clearly states that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. That is known as the Establishment Clause. And when it was challenged in the past, the Supreme Court clearly stated that the First Amendment has erected a wall between church and state. That wall must be kept high and impregnable. We could not approve the slightest breach. But in recent years, that impregnable wall has developed some very severe cracks. Remember Judge Roy Moore, the self-proclaimed Ten Commandments judge chosen to be Alabama's chief justice? You might remember him mostly for the pedophilia-related allegations, which he denied, that marred his Trump-endorsed run for the United States Senate. He was defeated by iconic civil rights lawyer Doug Jones. But back in 2001, Judge Moore became the hero of the religious right when under cover of night, he unilaterally had a 5,000-pound granite monument to the Ten Commandments installed in the rotunda of Alabama's state judicial building. A year later, a district judge ruled that the statue violated the Establishment Clause, and it was ultimately removed. The U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear the case. That was then. Today, after years of Republican political campaigning aiming to restore Christian indoctrination in schools and a well-resourced, disciplined campaign to fill the courts with members of the Christian right, it seems that a newly constructed 6-3 conservative court is ready to give its seal of approval. Yesterday, the court heard arguments involving a Washington state assistant football coach named Joseph Kennedy, a public school employee who repeatedly led his players in prayer at the 50-yard line immediately after games. A number of his players expressed their discomfort, claiming that they felt pressured to pray. He claimed it was private expression of prayer during business hours. The school informed him that his public prayer violated state law and school guidance. They offered him multiple accommodations, which he declined. He was placed on administrative leave, and during that time, his contract expired. He claims he was fired and filed suit. All of the lower courts ruled against him. Now, naturally, that turned him into the newest martyr of the religious right, and he took his case to the Supreme Court. Well, yesterday, the conservative justices signaled that they may indeed side with Coach Kennedy. With me now, Ellie Mastal, justice correspondent for The Nation, and Robert Jones, CEO and founder of Public Religion Research Institute and the author of White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity. Thank you both for being here. And Ellie, I'm going to start with you. The New York Times did a review of, of court rulings, r recent court rulings. And this was, it was published by something called, this, or the New York Times did a story about the Supreme Court review, which did a study documenting a 35% point in, percentage point increase in the rate of rulings in favor of religion in orally argued cases, culminating in an 81% success rate in the court under Chief Justice Roberts. This is the most pro, they're saying it's the most pro-religion court in uh, since World War II. It's really the more pro, most pro-Christianity court. So when you look at that record, it's pretty clear that this coach is going to win, right? Yeah, he's going to win. And the question is really how? Because people need to understand, this man was not fired for praying. You do not get fired in American culture for praying to a Christian God. You got some, you know, my Muslim friends, you know, call me later because that's not, that doesn't apply to you. But if you're praying to a Christian God, that's not, nothing's going to happen to you. This man had his contract unrenewed for being insubordinate and churlish, all right? Because first, yes, he was praying with the kids. Well, that clearly is unconstitutional. I don't even think the court is gonna let him get away on that. It's gonna let him skate on that, right? But then he threw a hissy fit and still had to go to the 50 yard line now by himself and pray there. Then he had to go on Good Morning America and talk about his hissy fit. Then he had to have his supporters come to the high school football game. Now, you know, I'm Catholic. My Jesus is spending his Friday nights at a soup kitchen maybe a methadone clinic, but you know, these, these Catholics, their Jesus is going there for Friday night lights. All right. So then his supporters show up at the high school football game, rush the field when he is praying, putting the students at danger. And that's why they didn't renew his contract. And so what we have to see from the Supreme court, and I don't know this yet, even based on the oral arguments, we have to see which which insubordinate behavior this current theocratic court is going to allow? Is it just yeah. the good morning going on Good Morning America part? Is it just the praying on, at the 50 yard line or is it going to go all the way back to indoctrinating all the students and making them pray with him?
You know, and I'm old enough to remember, um, Robbie, um, the prayer in schools debates, you know, mm. in the 1980s. And when I was in high school, there was a lot of action on the religious right bemoaning the fact that there's no longer pr Christian prayer in schools. I mean, they weren't they didn't want Muslim prayer in schools. They didn't, you know, they didn't want Jewish prayer in schools. They wanted specifically Christian prayer to be in schools. And, and, and they blamed in a lot of ways the courts for taking religion out of the schools. Well, here's their, re their record now. The Christian right has won a lot of cases. There's a United Pentecostal Church versus Newsom case that basically said, you know, they can go and be in church even during COVID. You know, there's the Hobby Lobby case. There's Master Pete Cake Shop. They are on a winning streak. So why is this feeling of persecution not going away when they are winning and winning and winning? Well, look, I, uh, thanks for having me on. I, I think that it really goes to this basic claim, this brazen claim that America is essentially meant to be a white Christian nation. And these are very intentional, very intentional acts, right? This is not, I mean, he could have gone to, his, to the parking lot and prayed, but he goes under the lights, 50 yard line. And look, I was a high school athlete, right? I remember the importance of getting the attention of a coach, yeah. right? To say this is not pressure, whatever. I mean, you show up early, you do the extra laps, and you, especially if you're fighting for your place on that team, you do whatever it takes to get noticed. And if you're on that team and you're not Christian and you want to play, you're, it's very clear that you're going to feel this kind of, you know, pray to play uh, kind of pressure on you um, to, to get out there and kind of be noticed and be seen as one of the, you know, team player, one of the, and I think that's really what a part of this is about. It's a state actor. It's a, a, you know, it's a public school. Uh, and what's notable, I think, is he, he said his inspiration was actually a movie that he watched where a coach did this. But in that movie, I actually looked it up. It was a private Christian academy right. that was the setting. Right. And now he's taking this to a public school. But I think the big point is, again, this sense that uh, this this claim is literally marking territory. That's why it's important that it was on the 50 yard line uh, at a public school. It's marking territory and this de declaration. This is a white Christian country. Uh, and just one more point. It, it's notable that white white evangelicals, very few Americans today feel like their religious liberties are being threatened. Um, in fact, the only religious group, the only religious group that believes their religious liberty is being threatened are white evangelicals. And 70 percent of them believe that their uh, religious liberties are being threatened. No other religious groups comes within 30 percentage points of that. Yeah. None of them. Um, and the last thing to say, I guess, is that it's also notable that um, the only other clergy that actually stepped up and made public statements in the Bremerton area were actually on the side of the school district um, mm. in this case, not not supporting this prayer in school because they saw it as a threat to religious liberty, which, you know, most religious groups uh, other than white evangelicals today actually still support. Yeah, I mean, and what happens then, Ellie, because this isn't a, a pro-religion court. It's a pro-just white Christian court. What happens when they strip away the power of the Establishment Clause? Well, what they're trying to do with this, right, is that they want their religious liberty to be able to impose their religion on everybody else. And so part of this larger culture war, war battle is that they want the religious freedom to be bigoted against LGBTQ communities, um, to be bigoted against trans people, um, and to generally kind of foist their religion on you. And it's interesting to me because the very same people who are making this argument that, mm -hmm. that we have to accept their religion in schools are the very same people who will say that we can't force public schools to teach the accurate history of slavery, okay. right? It's because coming out of the same side of the map, right? Yeah. So you, so yeah. on the one hand, so yeah. so so that that's a huge yeah. like, hypocrisy um, yeah. in, in terms of what they're doing. Uh, we're gonna have to have you guys back. You guys are a great duo. We'll have you guys back to talk more about this. Ellie Mastal, Robert Jones, thank you both very much. Up next, the not so free state of Florida becomes ground zero for conservative efforts. Speaking of, to ban books from schools and public libraries.